Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our daily Dhamma. Almost daily, because Wednesdays and Thursdays I'm off, but otherwise, pretty much every day. Today I wanted to look at the very beginnings of insight meditation in our study group. Today we just finished the Panya Bhumi, the uh, soil of understanding or the foundation of understanding. So a lot of technical stuff that was really a slog and it's to the credit of the students that everyone made it through that. But next we're going to be looking at the beginnings of insight, beginnings of practical uh, insight, knowledge. And so it's good for us as meditators. It's not just the very first stages, it's the very foundation of, uh, of knowledge on which we base the rest of our practice from here on in. So it's important that we're clear about this and always referring back to it. It's not just beginner stuff. The very basic, the very um, foundation of insight meditation is on the, it's called Ditti Visuddhi, it's based on, means the purification of view that's ba based on an understanding of what really exists. And not just an, an intellectual understanding, but it's starting to see what, uh, see the nature of reality for what it is. We start to see that in, in all of us, in each of us, in the universe in which each of us inhabits, the reality uh, that each of us occupies, there are two aspects. And these are called rupa and nama, or nama and rupa. Each and every one of us has two parts made up of two things, nama and rupa. Because all, all that each of us has is our experiences. If we get down to the very basics of what actually exists, all we see in the end is moment after moment of, of experience. That's as, as far down as we can go. Of course, based on these experiences, we come to conjecture that a lot of other things exist. We have the idea that our bodies exist. Of course, we get the idea that the room around us, the, the world around us exists, the objects uh, that we possess or that we come in contact with. We assume that other people actually exist, but all this is conjecture. What we can know for sure is that experience exists. Because that's what we can perceive and verify. That's it. Beyond that, it's all abstraction. And this is important. It's not a philosophical argument of whether anything, something exists or doesn't exist. It's that there's a qualitative difference, categorical difference, between experiencing or or knowing an experience and knowing, say, a, a, a friend or a, an object. When you look at a tree and you say that tree exists, knowing that is far less concrete and real than knowing that there's seeing when you see the tree, that there's an experience of seeing. The experience of seeing is far more real. So that's the basis of all of reality, but then we see something curious about reality, that it, it's made up of two parts.
Normally we call these the physical and the mental. Nama and Rupa. Nama means, Nama is the mental. It, it, it's called Saramana, that which takes an object. Different from Rupa, which is Anaramana, doesn't take an object. What that means is Nama is able to know things. Nama is that aspect of reality that is aware, conscious, it's consciousness. Rupa is that acknowledged aspect of reality that doesn't know anything, but is a part of experience all, all the same. I mean, each of our experiences is different. There's so much involved in experience. You can say it's all experience, but there's so much. And it, it, it seems you know, seeing is different from hearing, hearing is different from smelling. Liking is different from disliking. Even the various experiences of the body are different. Experiencing heat and cold is different from experiencing tension or hardness, softness. When we breathe in, our stomach, our, our body expands. The expansion is accompanied with tension. That tension is a part of the experience. I mean, it is an experience. And then when the breath goes out, there's a release. And that release is is of a different quality from the expansion, has a different feeling to it. But the idea behind all of this is to remove from our minds and from our psyche, all the views that we carry around about what's real, the confusion, you know, the idea that there's a self or a soul, the idea that the body exists. It allows us to differentiate between concept and reality and to see that, and to see that so much of what we think of as real is, is, is really just all in our mind. It's important because it sets the stage for our understanding of how reality works, which is in turn important because that's where all the problems come from. We really do have problems. We, we have bad habits. We cause ourselves suffering. We cause suffering to others. So just like if you want to fix a car or an engine, you have to take it apart and, and look at what's really going on inside. You can't just kick it or keep trying to turn the key and hoping that it works. You can't pray to the gods. You have to actually look inside. It's the difference between a person who owns a car and the, autom the, the mechanic who fixes the car. Ordinary people are like people who drive cars and when it's broken they take it to the mechanic and magic gets fixed. So they think in terms of the, the car, but the mechanic looks at a car and they, they know all the pieces of the car. This is what we're trying to become through our meditation practice. We're trying to learn how to fix the car. And so we have to see deeper than, than ordinary reality. Ordinary reality will get you through the day. I mean, if you, un if you think of this room existing, these people existing, it's very useful. Well, it's useful to think that the car exists because then you know, okay, if I go outside, that car is there. You don't have to just stand there saying, seeing, seeing. You know that if you pull, the door will open and you can sit down and turn the key and drive away. You can't, be, you can't, you can't go the other route of understanding the nature of reality and freeing yourself from suffering. And so what we're doing here is quite different. We're trying to take apart the motor, so to speak, take apart the engine and clean it and fix it and put it back together. So rupa, 
Rupa basically is, is the four elements. So what exists, what we experience is we experience hardness and softness, that's the earth element. The earth is just a name, it doesn't, it doesn't actually mean there's earth there. It's just really a, a, a term for it. But we have this aspect of, of the physicality. When we experience what's physical, sometimes there's softness, sometimes there's hardness. And there's the tension when you watch the stomach rising, there's the tension in the stomach when you watch it falling. There's the flaccidity, the release of tension. That's the air element, that's what we call it, it's just a name. The fire element, you experience the heat in the body, or cold. Both of those are the fire element. And then the water element isn't really part of experience, but it's, it's conceived to be there as well. It's the cohesion, the stickiness. You don't actually experience it, so that's just a technicality. The point being, this is, this is what we mean by rupa. So when you, when you watch the stomach rising, what is it that's rising? Is it the nama or the rupa? What is it that's rising? Does anyone have the answer? I may just confuse the heck out of you. What is it that rises? Nama or Rupa? It's Rupa the elephant. Hmm? Rupa, Rupa is... Dar says Nama is rising. Huh? What is it that's rising? Nama or Rupa? Rupa. Rupa rises. What is it that knows that the Rupa is rising? Nama. When you walk, which one walks? Rupa or Nama? Rupa. And which one knows that you're walking? Nama. Mm. When you talk, which one talks, Rupa or Nama? Rupa. Which one knows that you're talking or knows what you're going to say? Nama. Nama. Does Rupa know what you're going to say? No. No. It's the very basis of insight to be able to see these. It doesn't really matter, you don't have to think about them too much. It's just the fact that you can see them means you've gone beyond the idea of me and mine and I. You've gone, or, or I anyway, you've gone behind, be, beyond views of self and, and so on. And we're not talking about the, we're not, we're not cultivating a view that the self doesn't exist or something like that. What we're saying is stop thinking in terms of views and start looking in terms of experiences and observations. To get beyond that. So many, many people, when they hear this, they, they start to worry and think, you know, what's, what's going to happen to myself? And they're missing the whole point because they're still thinking. They're, no, they're, they're not yet, they haven't yet penetrated this, this wall between intellectualization or views and ideas and abstractions about reality and an actual experience of reality. So, so the use of asking these questions and talking about this is to make clear the difference and to help to see the, the uh, distinction between reality and, and concept. So what you should start to see, you should start to see the, that nama and rupa arise and cease. When you walk stepping right, it, there's the arising of the experience and the cessation. When you move your left foot stepping left, there's the arising and there's the cessation. So contrary to what we might believe about reality, reality is born and dies every moment. 
anything that we think of as existing, as lasting, is really, really just a, a thought, a concept in our minds. We conceive of the same experience or sort of similar experiences again and again, and we conceive of them as being uh, an entity. So you see the same thing and you say, oh, well, that's, the, that's a car. Yep, car's still there. You look again, you see again the car. But the reality, the experience, arises and ceases. It's, it's born and dies. This is really this is what gets through that idea, the view of self. The second aspect is how they relate to each other in terms of cause and effect, and this gets into the idea of karma. We we're talking about karma today. I mentioned that karma is is not quite what we think it is. We think of karma as you do something, like you kill someone, and then you suffer the retribution in a future life. Maybe someone kills you, but that's not what karma really means. Or it's not the the the, the precise truth about karma. Karma is a moment when you have an ethical mind state. And ethical, we just mean something that uh, is going to have consequences. It's, it, there's a, a value placed on, on the experience. You like something or you dislike something. Or you have a clear objective mind. So there's a, an attachment, an aversion, or a delusion, or there's clarity and contentment, or, you know, different ways of reacting to experiences. That's karma. Because, and that experience will, will change uh, or will bring about results. But the result of karma is just more experience. So experiences are actually the result of karma. That's what you begin to see. The second thing that you begin to see in the practice is you begin to see not only are these things arising and ceasing when I step or when I sit or when I think or when I feel but they're related. And if I get really angry, I'm going to feel a lot of pain in, in the head, you know, tension in the body. If I get worried, I'm going to feel stress in the body, right? That's all that karma means, you, that we cause ourselves suffering. On the other hand, if I'm mindful, if I see things clearly, it's like untying a knot and suddenly I'm free and clear and peaceful in the mind. So the result is positive. This is course a very important thing to see. This is the beginning of, of the Four Noble Truths. When you start to see that suffering is caused by all sorts of defilements in the mind, any kind of clinging, any kind of attachment to the experience or reaction to it. And that peace and freedom from suffering comes from not reacting, but rather experiencing and seeing things as they are. There was, um, in, uh, in one of I was reading an article about childbirth. It was a really interesting article about childbirth. This woman, she actually gave birth in a, in a hospital. And she, she, she recounts the trauma involved. Um, the pain and the stress and the physical um, torture involved. Eventually, there was. She had scarring by the end of it, and, and had to have surgery. And, and she was completely drugged up. It was just. A, it was quite a sort of a shocking thing to read, you know, just to think about how painful childbirth can be. And so, uh, I mean, reading it just made me think of, wow, this is uh, part of life, part of the nature of life. But then she goes on 
to talk about how she got pregnant a second time and started thinking about this suffering. You know, this, is this a part of life? Is this what I have to look forward to? And she was terrified of having to give birth. And then she started to do some research. And she found that the, this, this curious idea that people were talking about giving birth at home, and anyway, the, the, the idea is eventually she gave birth, but she had her second pregnancy, her second birth, second childbirth at home. And the point, the reason why I'm telling you this is because it was, because of the lack of stress, the childbirth was completely different, and it was, it was peaceful, she didn't have to have any medication, she, uh, you know, there was no problems or, or trauma or stress, she didn't, uh, you know, it was a completely different story. So we were given this article to read, one of our professors gave it to us, and it just made me think of, of you know, it's a very good example of how the mind and the body work together, uh, a very real example and a very powerful one. Because you often think that, well, childbirth is, for those, those who have experience with it, you often think that childbirth is just a traumatic experience. You know, it's something that's very painful, scary. And scary because it's painful, because the body is, is unprepared. But the funny thing is, is that the body can be quite prepared, and the body is, is quite plastic as it relates to the mind, meaning the mind has such power over the body. I think this is a, a great example. You know, we can talk about how the mind can cause you stress in the body when you're anxious, your heart starts beating rapidly. You, know? you ever think about how that works, right? What, what really happens is that the, the defilements in the mind, the, the bad habits in the mind cause stress, cause physical harm. But nothing says it more than, than this, this reality of childbirth, how stressful it can be. And then you think it's completely, you know, it's, it's mainly caused by the fact that my mind was stressed, that I was afraid. These are the consequences. This is the importance of understanding how Rupa and Nama work. The, the theory that I'm giving you is not important, but it challenges you to ask yourself, am I seeing Nama and Rupa? And that's what's important, because once you see it, once you look and you see Nama and Rupa for yourself, that's where the doors open. That's where your life begins to change and where you enter on this path of purification, where gradually, slowly, over time, long time, short time, depends on you, you free yourself from all these bad habits and all these problems and you stop hurting yourself, you stop causing yourself stress and suffering. So I think that's important. It's important at least to affirm this and to remind ourselves. The basis of our practice is Nama Rupa. The basis of our practice is the physical and mental aspects of experience. It's not me or mine or I. It's not beings or... It's just moments, moments of experience. When we do walking meditation, we're not trying to walk to get to the wall. What's the point? You just have to turn around and walk back. The point is to be aware of each movement, because that's Nama Rupa. When you sit, it's not about getting control of the breath, it's about watching each movement of the breath, because that's Nama Rupa. When you watch the Rupa, you're going to see Nama. As you watch the stomach rising and falling, you'll see you learn all sorts of things about the nama, about your mind. You see, sometimes there's stress over it, sometimes there's desire over it, expectations over it, fear, worry. And sometimes there's clarity, sometimes there's mindfulness, wisdom. This is where all of our insight meditation occurs. So, there you go. A little bit of Dhamma for tonight. Thank you all for tuning in. Wish you all good practice.